All right. For the first part of class, we are going to be focusing on acousmatic music analysis and deconstruction of sounds, and then how to reconstruct them as well. So let's start off with a quick discussion, broadly speaking, as to what acousmatic music is. Again, really broadly speaking, acousmatic music is music that is intended to be performed solely through playback on speakers or headphones. No human performers that are up on stage doing anything to create it, just hitting playback. That's it. So there are historical precedents to this that kind of have developed to create this whole genre of music. Things like musique concrète, where you couldn't play those sounds together. You were assembling sonic collages of railroad sounds, uh, sounds of your pets, uh, things that were being uh, overheard in cafes, and then editing those, arranging those, and creating new sound works. Uh, there are synthesizer works. For example, the early uh, Switched On Bach by Wendy Carlos requires that you record every single part every timbre change for every part as a mono track, bounce it all down, and then put that all on tape. It's impossible to play that as a single person. You would have to have hundreds of people playing all of the various synthesizer orchestration parts. Uh, computer performances, things where the computer is generating a score and then having a audience play it. We're not talking about those, but we're talking about things where the computer is processing data and playing that data back in a musical manner. So uh, going back to Daisy Bell being sung by a computer or things like Paul Lansky's piece, Not Just More Idle Chatter, which is manipulating human speech in ways that, you know, you would need a choir of millions of people all suggesting random sounds at the same time to create. And then now we have virtual reality pieces as well, where you put on an Oculus headset and depending on what's going on uh, in the virtual reality with your use of the controllers and the head tracking, that will influence what you hear. But acousmatic music has always been focused on the organization of sound objects, which could be non-musical, things like in musique concrète, or it could be musical material the layering of sounds, and diffusing them across an array of speakers in order to create a musical narrative. So think of it as sonic storytelling, where as the composer, you're placing sounds in the speaker field over time in a way that draws and controls the audience's attention. You can develop ideas and motives, not in the way that you would through traditional pencil and paper notation and then you know orchestrating it out, but by adding effects, using automation, uh, shaping the envelopes, changing the pitch, glissandoing different ideas. You can generate new timbres. You can play around with hybrid uh, samples where you have the initial attack phase of a cat and then have that fade into the sound of a clarinet and use that as your source material. You can create tension and release by using traditional ideas of consonance and dissonance and maybe playing things out on a MIDI sampler. Uh, you can use layering and have different tones, different ideas of harmonic and inharmonic consonance and dissonance, uh, sounds that sound pleasing together, sounds that sound grating. Maybe layer some nice ethereal synth pad and then have nails down a chalkboard and use that to create dissonance. Or you can also use silence, which helps to generate massive, massive amounts of anticipation and tension when your listeners are not expecting uh, anything other than the resolution of that silence, where you're holding their attention, drawing it out until a pin could drop, and then finally giving voice to that dissonance uh, release by bringing back sound. That can actually be a type of consonance and dissonance as well. And most importantly, you can create a narrative arc. How do you shape the piece? How do you give it form? Are you developing something throughout? Are you introducing new ideas? Are you constantly referring back to previous ideas? What are you telling the audience with the way that you're shaping and forming the piece? But before we get to that, 
Let's start with a little bit of analysis. What are you hearing? So there's a couple of technical things to look and listen for in a recording or in a piece of music. The first is the transients. These are the short volume spikes in the attack and decay portion of the sound envelope. Ramps up to maximum amplitude and then decays. Very ide easily identifiable in the waveform view because they're the largest peaks. Uh, these are very, very useful for things like beat detection, identifying and syncing tempos, and identifying individual notes. Not just the sustain of the note, but where the note actually hits. The next thing to really look at is the overtones, the partials. As we talked about last year, any non-sine wave is the sum of different frequencies and amplitudes with the aggregate creating the timbre. The overtones are the frequencies above the fundamental frequency, but at a reduced amplitude. And they can either be in a mathematical relationship of nice whole number multiples to the fundamental, which means that they are harmonic. These are the sounds that generally we think of as being musical or pleasing to listen to. But if they are not in this nice whole numbered relationship to the fundamental, then they are inharmonic. These tend to sound more metallic, more bell-like, more uh, not really discordant because they're not out of tune, but uh, timbrely discordant. We'll go with that. With the overtones, you're not going to see these in a waveform view. You will need to switch to either the spectrum or the spectrogram view. So if you're viewing the audio itself, you have a couple of different views. You have waveform view, which shows the amplitude of peaks and troughs of the audio file, normalized to negative one or negative uh, minimal amplitude to zero, which is nothing to positive one, which is positive maximum amplitude. Remember that with dealing with amplitude, you have the positive side is the speaker pushing out air and the negative side is the speaker drawing back to its position and the rarefaction of the air and the molecules within it. Spectrum view is showing frequency across the x-axis and amplitude across the y-axis of a sound. Amplitude is different from a waveform view though as the spectrum is showing the amplitude of each frequency component, although you'll usually be able to pick out the partials easiest, while the waveform is showing the amplitude of the overall signal. It is the overall volume, not the volume of the individual parts of a sound. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that spectrum view will change with time as the signal changes. So it's going to be animated. You'll see different peaks pop up and then disappear. You'll see things moving if you're sweeping a frequency uh, filter. You'll see things changing or not changing. Very important to keep that in mind. Then we have the spectrogram or the sonogram. This shows time on the x-axis and frequency along the y-axis. But the amplitude is shown by color intensity. The brighter the color, the more intense the amplitude at that particular frequency. And this color will vary from program to program. Audacity will display it in a different color palette than Reaper, which will be different from TS2, which will be different from Max MSP. So just be aware that color is swappable and does not mean anything from different programs. It just is how they represent it. But the intensity of the color is the key. Up at the top here, we have a waveform view. This is just showing good old sawtooth wave. Nothing to write home about. Below this, however, we see the spectrum view. So we can see we've got a really, really nice fundamental at 100 hertz. And then we have partials at 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, and 900, all of which have significantly decreased amplitude from the fundamental. Another way of showing the spectrum is like this. Uh, this is a graph from uh, Mathematica. 
And it shows we have a fundamental at 50 hertz, and then we have partials at 1, 250, 350, and 450. And you'll notice that this is filling in the uh, amplitudes between all of those fundamentals and partials as uh, different parts of uh, the waveform. This is a very common view. Uh, you'll see that in a lot of different uh, spectrum analyzers. Finally, we have a sonogram. If you look at the bottom, you'll see the bands that are moving uh, around 100 to 300 hertz as the most intense. Uh, those are the brightest color, but then above those you have stacked up what looks like copies that are getting smaller and smaller and darker and darker as this goes up. Those are the overtones of the signal, and indeed they are decreasing in amplitude as the frequency goes up, and you can see that as the amplitude is getting uh, darker and darker in color. Another thing that's going to help is to verbally describe the sounds that you are listening to. This is going to come in really handy. Keep in mind that sonic descriptors are a totally different thing. This is not technical. We will do sonic descriptors in interactive computer music. But for now, verbal descriptions. How accurately can you use your words to describe what you're hearing? Things like whooshes and swoops are generally going to be sounds uh, that are whooshing around the sound field really quickly, really quick pans, uh, reversed sounds that build up like a reverse cymbal crash before you have the classic impact sound. Uh, impacts, hits, booms, sounds that are significantly louder than a standard percussive event. Like if you're watching a movie and you see the asteroid swoop by and then smack into Earth, that's the type of sound. Uh, layers and hybrid sounds. Are you hearing multiple samples spliced together, crossfaded to create a new cool sound? Like maybe you hear a cat meowing at a pitch and then that pitch crossfades into the sustain of a saxophone. Notes and chords, obviously, we're all musicians here. That's going to be pretty obvious. Uh, rhythm, ostinato, and percussive events. Again, we're musicians. We already know those. Uh, texture descriptors, just to refresh your memory on there. Is it a monophonic, polyphonic, or homophonic piece? Is the texture, if you're going beyond that, rough? Is it smooth? Is it dark? Is it light? How do you describe the texture? Grating, sandpapery, nails on a chalkboard, screeching, uh, or is it smooth and relaxing, like silk against the ear? So what does the sound remind you of? That's another descriptor you can use. Also, is it an obvious sample? Have they clearly sampled a dog barking and are playing it back on a keyboard? Uh, is it meant to mimic a real-life object? Or is it something that is hyper-real and sounds more like what you would hear in a film, which we'll definitely be talking about later in this semester. Beyond describing sounds, we're going to be talking a lot about deconstructing sounds. What happens when you slow down the sound and zoom in on it? Do you hear any clicks if you scrub through? That's usually a good clue that it's been created for multiple clips and that they didn't bother with zero crossing edits. If you zoom in to the waveform and the spectrogram, are there obvious breaks in a sound? Again, that's a really good clue that it's been compiled from multiple sounds or multiple files. If you listen to the sound, can you hear fading or crossfading? Can you hear artifacts from warping, aliasing, uh, time stretching, anything like that? Are there other clues? If you look at the spectrogram, is it suspiciously clean? Or does it have a suspicious amount of noise in it, like they're doing something with uh, white noise or pink noise? Is the waveform normal and uniform across the center line, or does it have some weird DC offset where it's occurring more in the positive side or more in the negative side? What if you play the sound in reverse? Does it sound like something you would normally hear in everyday life, just that's been reversed? 
What if you transpose the sound up or down or change the speed? Does that make it sound like something you normally would hear? As an example of what I was talking about earlier with breaks in the sound here, if you take a look in the two highlighted white regions, look at the sonogram. You'll notice that it goes completely black. This is a really, really good clue that this has been compiled from multiple recordings. So take a look at those fine black lines there. Absolutely no blue inside those. No ambient room noise, room reflections. This is a clear edit job. With reconstruction, once you've identified the sound, can you create it yourself? There are some really common sources that are used in acousmatic music. Animals, birds, your cat, your dog. What if you take other things and layer them together, like the noise from a bear or a crocodile, and warp them and change their spectrum and cross-multiply their uh, envelopes? Metal sounds. Tibetan prayer bowls are always a favorite, but uh, also, you know, I've got a really, really nice sounding mixing bowl. Wooden percussion, claves, love them. Bones, handheld wooden instruments, uh, glass or small stone, water. Composers really love to play with water. Reversed sounds. Uh, symbols are traditional, but anything can be reversed. Household objects or things you find in your fridge. What happens if you snap a piece of salary really, really close to a mic? What about non-standard instruments in the Western canon or vocal performance techniques? You know, what if you take, instead of the sound of a violin, what if you record a really good air who player and then chop up what they recorded and use that? Or instead of standard singing techniques, what if you use Sprechstimme or throat singing? And of course, synthesizers. Synthesizers are always a good choice for creating new sounds or for trying to recreate a sound that you hear. We're going to be experimenting with these a lot over the course of the semester. In fact, the way that I've structured the class with all the lectures being pre-posted online, this is what we're going to spend the bulk of our time doing in class. For now, I want you to start thinking about what you're really hearing in your own work and in the pieces that your classmates create. Also, think about the sounds you hear as you're going about your day. I really encourage you, just as a really good exercise, to take around a portable recorder with you. And if you hear something interesting, try and record it. And then see what you can do with it. Can you warp it? Can you transpose it? Can you play with it? Uh, can you try and recreate it out of other means? And don't forget that effects and sampler devices are a really, really effective way for manipulating sounds. We're going to be playing with those a lot again in this class, but yeah, super effective way to play back and manipulate.